but uh, in uh, another parallel life, uh, I'm also the compounder of uh, Hack Your PhD, an association about uh, the topic uh, that is the topic of the afternoon, open science. Um, so I choose voluntarily uh, to speak about open hikes because uh, now open science is so uh, hype that there is like afternoon session at the Ecole Normale Superior about this topic. Um, so I don't know if where we are in this curve that I would try to uh, trigger a discussion about what open science means for you and what we have uh, experienced through uh, now more than seven years of association uh, acti associative activity and grassroots movement around that. So we created initially uh, the association Hacker PhD uh, so in 2012, uh, at that time we were connected to uh, uh, different emerging grassroots movements in Paris related to uh, the sharing economy and uh, kind of a mood about uh, common good and uh, how we can uh, think about social profit instead of uh, commercial profit in innovation, etc. And so, for instance, here there's like a, a photo at uh, La Payasse, so maybe some of you know this uh, location. And um, with uh, Celia Grison-Daniel, who co-founded the association with me, was more from the sociology. Our goal was to really create uh, discussions and gathering around the concept of open science, instead of imposing a specific definition of what open science should be. And so in the case of Celia, it's, she was more in humanities and sociological approach. She conducted more than uh, 80 interviews around the world uh, about this topic, meeting early adopters and early actors, for instance, in the open access movement. And we organized more than 50 events uh, around these topics. So if you uh, follow our activity uh, on uh, social media, for instance, we have a, a collective curation approach about that, and on our blog we try to uh, document also what we have done and what we are doing. So for instance, we have also created uh, uh, support for communicating about the concepts of open science to uh, a large public. And for the workshop, it goes from, uh, for instance, uh, I created the Open Geek workshops where the idea was to train people to learn to code with open source uh, tools. And later on, uh, others in the association also added a component of uh, what are the conceptual tools for being a geek in uh, <coughs> uh, the digital world. So for example, the of license, Creative Commons, uh, or license for source code, etc., and how to navigate that. And even also workshop about business model. So like here we work with uh, without model, uh, community because like a big issue about open science is the business model behind it and uh, we're going to discuss about that but it's bigger than the, the rest but so when we started we were we didn't want it to impose an idea but there were like still uh, underlying and an explicit definition of what open science could be and it was intimately linked to what the internet created as a blank slate for uh, knowledge and knowledge sharing, especially, for instance, Wikipedia, uh, with the kind of game changing in the way of how knowledge is created collaboratively and uh, how it's managed to have um, auto um, feedback of correction and so on. So when we arrive at this huge collaborative, such as Wikipedia, that managed to have so much uh, effort to correct itself and attain uh, error level that are comparable to a professional encyclopedia. That's uh, very interesting. And another motivation was that uh, behind these words, uh, like open science or sharing economy or knowledge economy, uh, we wanted to understand also what, was the, what were the values associated with those words. And especially, uh, for instance, here, how we go from something that is very objective and uh, uh, I would say uh, 
abstract like data to something more uh, knowledge and wisdom is more incarnated, embodied, and uh, in social, with social values. So the other trigger uh, to this uh, experiment was this tension also that we may have already experienced between what science is and what academia is. And uh, initially, actually, Hack Your PhD, so the name was about uh, hacking your PhD in a real sense uh, because uh, when Celia started uh, to do her PhD, she realized that she didn't want it to do it as PhD well done. Like uh, basically she wanted to be funded by a crowdfunding uh, thing uh, to document everything she was doing and uh, to have necessarily reproducibility, to, to mix qualitative and quantitative approach, etc. And so this tension was already present and, uh, in a lot of minds. And I think uh, we arrived at a, a point where when Celia posted on social media all what she was feeling about that, there, there were like so many resonance uh, with other people that we created a community around that. And well, the first uh, scaffolding <coughs> or grid of interpretation we tried to adopt for this open science movement was uh, what has been done before uh, in uh, open source, for instance. Open source software is a good uh, illustration of uh, change of procedure and ability to uh, work with source code. And uh, uh, unfortunately, this also representing the gender imbalance in, in, uh, in science, uh, but uh, in open source, those three uh, guys uh, illustrate well the gradient of behind the word open source, how different can be the different approach you can have of this open source. So on the right, it's uh, Richard Stallman who created the general public license, uh, which is like a open source license, uh, and the Free Software Foundation uh, advocating the use of open source software more like for like freedom of speech rather than uh, open source like in free beer. Uh, and this guy has been recently uh, attacked because apparently for misconduct, so uh, it's to check out also what's going on in the open source movement. The guy in the middle is Linus Torvald. Linus Torvald uh, is a uh, Finns academic in Finland. He worked on uh, the first uh, open source operating system, Linux. Uh, and uh, in this case, it's more like a, a balanced uh, approach. It's not like a, in the, the value of uh, free software uh, as a ideology, but more like a, as a pragmatic choice for him. Coding open source is more efficient and it's an optimal way of working together in a modern time. And the guy on the left, is uh, Bob Young. Uh, some of you may know uh, his first company called Red Hat. Uh, that's why it's funny that he has uh, always <laughs> a Red Hat. Um, so this guy made a company out of uh, open source software. So he, he, he took like uh, Linux and package it and sell it to companies uh, while it was uh, a free uh, <coughs> thing initially. And he managed to make a business model out of it. So selling the service around a product that is basically open. So I don't think these three guys have the same idea of what open source is. And I think in open science, we have the same problem. Like behind the words open science, there are many perspectives that collide. And uh, well, Open source has been very uh, inspiring and uh, at the point where open science has uh, even stolen the open source initiative logo. Um, and roughly we can see that there is also a connection with open source because open science is intimately linked with the emergence of internet and collaborative tools. And uh, 
also to the sharing at the uh, intellectual property that open source also triggers. So how you uh, share knowledge like uh, with the open access journal, for instance. But these three different topics appeared as a good first approximation of the tones that were emerging on the open science community. First, uh, the fact that it regards research, education, and knowledge. Uh, second, that it's about collaboration and sharing of this uh, uh, knowledge. And third, that uh, it catalyzes practices through digital technology. And I, I will try to illustrate a bit uh, those different aspects. If you need like a more academic definition, uh, here is one by uh, early people writing about the topics. Uh, open science refers to a scientific culture that's characterized by its openness. Scientists share results almost immediately and with a very wide audience, which is uh, one definition. Usually you cannot reduce that to that, but if you want a definition, that would be one. So we spoke about open source, maybe like uh, one of the movements uh, behind open science was also the open course and the MOOC, basically. So the multi multiple open online courses. Uh, I will later on speak about open washing and how open science slipped a bit. Now you have MOOCs that are <coughs> paid. So you have to pay for something that is open. That show how weird things have gone. Um, but initially, th so the idea was if we have internet and we can share courses, I mean, <coughs> as usual, physicists were doing that for decades in their HTML website, but still it was not maintained in a platform and so on. So when um, uh, the MIT created their open courseware or uh, then Coursera and so on started to develop platform for MOOCs, that was one of the ideas of opening knowledge and we will come back later on why it was a failure. But another big thing, and I think that's the most successful aspect of open science so far, uh, is the opening of uh, scientific publishing. And uh, well, it has been a success because it was so obvious that there was like something wrong going on here. I mean, <laughs> now people, when you communicate and you explain that you are actually reviewing for free for a publisher that then, uh, ask money for the people who want to publish and the people who want to read, they say like, it's a, it's a scam, right? So, well, that's why also it was successful because it was so timely and so legitimate criticism uh, because with the lowering of the cost of publishing papers, basically the, uh, the added value of publishing companies became like uh, a bit questionable. And uh, so two uh, people were illustrating this uh, tendency in an activist fashion. So Howard Schwartz, I don't know if you're all familiar with this guy. If you're not, I, I, I encourage you deeply to watch a documentary called The, the Internet uh, Boy. Uh, it was really, really uh, shocking in a way. So this guy was... Uh, implicated in the first uh, RSS feed and Reddit website. It was a very good uh, and young activism for sharing of knowledge and he was caught at MIT uh, downloading massively uh, GStore uh, repository to share after the PDF. Yes? Sorry, the uh, documentary channel is Boy? Uh, something like that. Yeah, uh, the internet. Maybe you can shoot. Uh, you can search on the Google or something. But uh, Aaron Schwartz biography, it, it's now uh, published on, uh, for free on the internet. You can find it. And it's, it tells the story of how uh, such a person was meanwhile legitimate and supported of uh, the community. So what's the title? Internet's own boy. Uh, internet own boy, right. Um, and so he, he was very active, for instance, uh, in the fight against uh, Bill, uh, like uh, um, IPA, I don't remember the, the, the term, but it was like a bill at the 
House of Congress uh, that was completely passing uh, without the understanding of the community and Schwartz was very active in uh, making the balance go uh, in the sharing of knowledge instead of closing of knowledge. And basically, the documentary is explained very well. After he was caught by uh, MIT, uh, stalling, uh, downloading a PDF, uh, he was pushed up to the, at the point where he committed suicide. Uh, so it's like quite uh, illustrative of how uh, fighting against uh, establishment is uh, complicated. And Alexandra Albakin, it's another personality, uh, but uh, also a very interesting one. So she is uh, Russian, and uh, she created the uh, SciHub website that uh, even scientists who have access to paper use because it's more convenient than the <laughs> usual uh, system for accessing a PDF. Uh, I mean, that's a true story. Sometimes like, it's more complicated to have the proxy and so on than uh, as just adding site.com slash the URL. But, well, I'm not here to judge. I'm just like uh, uh, illustrating that. So open access is timely and uh, it obey also to a need of, uh, uh, like there is an imbalance of access to, to the, those publishing uh, in different country, and uh, we will go back for the MOOC uh, because, for instance, uh, uh, in country uh, like IT or in Africa, uh, there are uh, people who have not even the broadband access to uh, for downloading MOOCs. And in the same way, their their university doesn't have access to a, a publisher uh, or science uh, science direct and stuff like that. So there is a need for accessing those uh, knowledge out there. And uh, a last thing to mention about open access is that it's not about only uh, availability, because like some people reduce that to just the fact that it's out there, and so they use uh, ResearchGate or Academia.edu to say, oh, but it's open access the same. No, uh, behind the terminology, there is also the, the idea of reuse rights and uh, it connects to the, the notion of when you are writing a paper and Elsevier asking you your, your authorization to take the, all, all the right to what you wrote, that there is something wrong there, basically. Um, so yeah, so here is Sci-Hub. Another aspect, and uh, you're gonna have a, a presentation ap just after on those issue, is the, the question of integrity and reproducibility. Uh, so when you have uh, the concept of open science, it's not only open in one direction from the science to the world, uh, but also uh, from the world to the scientists and uh, checking and uh, having a transparency access to what's going on. And over the, the last years, there is an increasing uh, recognition that there were like a problem with the publish or perish incentive structure in science, and especially uh, in the case of reproducibility, that it was kind of uh, stretching uh, claims and methodology up to the point where there is a replication crisis. So here it's uh, for psychology, but I mean, all the fields of science are touched by that. Maybe uh, psychology was the easiest to talk to people because they were taking uh, results that appear as, oh yeah, making sense to most of the people, and then showing that the data were not that strong, <laughs> and to uh, to tame also a bit this, because uh, again, even after this uh, replication crisis paper in science, uh, journalists were also over sensationalizing the thing, and totally misinterpreting the data, so it's not like you have uh, a huge amount of majority of papers that were not reproducible, but the effect size were not the, as big as initially reported. So there is a crisis, but uh, still, and it's complicated in our uh, post-factual slash uh, uh, fake news democracy spirit, uh, to say, oh shit, 
we have done, we, we messed up, everything we did is wrong and so on because it could have consequences of people who say, oh no, science is not uh, reliable and so on. So it's still that indeed there is a problem of reproducibility, but science methodology is, is working in a way because we managed to prove it and to uh, reinsert this, uh, this insight into our practice. And that's what's going on and that's what, for instance, the Center for Open Science was very uh, uh, needed as a structure. The, the other thing is that uh, basically uh, Ioannidis, for instance, uh, who was working on the question of reproducibility for years, was already uh, making people aware that basically in science, uh, we know that a lot of results are false and it's part of the game. And the, the point is to control for it. And like a, one, one answer to that is the raw producibility and how to change uh, the methodology we are using in science for preventing this uh, false alarm and false positive. So here is an illustration by uh, uh, my PhD student, Yang Ming Kim. Uh, who is currently uh, finishing her thesis this week, so I would have to go back after this talk to help her. Uh, it has been complicated because indeed uh, we ended up working on reproducibility at our own expense because we took a paper in Nature Methods that was super, super interesting. Everybody was super interested in this method. And after two years, <coughs> uh, so the method was written in MATLAB and uh, we were supposed to have a coffee at the Place de la Concorde. And by using Python, using the same methods, we ended up in the middle of Atlantic. Um, so we turned it as an opportunity to analyze what was going on here. And we wrote a paper about all the problems we encounter to reproduce this methodology. So here is another illustration by Amin Kim with the <laughs> the tip of the iceberg of uh, reproducibility with like us in a little boat going to this nature method paper saying like, oh, that's wonderful. And then we discovered that uh, there were language issue, version of language issue, the file format were not that clear, um, the metadata of the data were not that clear, uh, the parameter option were not really discussed in the, the paper and uh, some things that appeared as a constant in the paper were actually variable in the, in the, in the code, etc., etc. And so uh, now it's published, but uh, I put it voluntarily, the preprint, to say like uh, we contacted uh, Nature to try to make a rebuttal of the original paper, and of course they were not really interested. Uh, but anyway, we did our preprint, we put it out there, and uh, we propose solutions uh, for at least uh, <laughs> increasing the reproducibility and the, the, the work of working in bioinformatics towards like a consensus data set, for instance, to, to allow people to challenge methodology and uh, have a canonical example that the community can reuse. So I won't describe all the potential solutions that we describe, but so, it was also a way to introduce stuff that were connected to these open science uh, dynamics recently. So first, the preprint. I mean, uh, that's something that really changed in the last decade. Uh, again, uh, if there are physicists in the room, they're going to say archive exists for more than uh, 20 years. But uh, bioarchive, for instance, the biomed community, and now there is a even a med archive in medicine. And 10 years ago, you would have discussed with a, a biomedical researcher to put their work on the internet without uh, <coughs> peer review, they would find you nuts. So now it's occurring because there is like this global movement occurring. So preprint, uh, the research ID. So that's also is something that has a uh, Kick, uh, kick in in the last decade, so to have like uh, one ID to rule them all and uh, try to have uh, tools through uh, digital technology. 
uh, half metric, so it's a way of uh, changing the, the uh, notion of how my paper or the paper I'm looking at is discussed by other scientists. So it's more like the corridor metric uh, of uh, the web 2.0 because in the past people were discussing their paper uh, like that and nowadays it's more on Twitter. And for the, the preprint, so that's the uh, long story uh, in one picture. So you can see that uh, in uh, the span of 10 years, it has totally exploded. I mean, the, the number of, uh, of preprints, especially in green, it's a uh, bioarchive, uh, has totally exploded. And uh, well, the illustration of HKCD is a bit also uh, uh, nicely put the, <laughs> the paradox of the academic publishing and why maybe this preprint stuff has so well uh, kick-started because a lot of people were a bit frustrated by this uh, never-ending uh, publisher problems. Uh, last but not least, uh, in parallel to the changes in, in science, there were like a big buzz. Uh, now it's AI, but ten, 10 years ago it was big data whatever it means, like people were obsessed with big data. And it tends to uh, have been uh, uh, synergized with the, this openness uh, feeling into the open data movement. So how you can turn data into uh, not gold, because that, that's what people wanted, but more in interoperable uh, items for research. So. Uh, the problem is that, um, so there's many uh, different problems. Uh, it's that open data, like uh, open access, has been initially understood as just, I put my data on the internet. And so like in a lot of papers, including the nature method we try to replicate, the, the person actually was pretty transparent, put a zip file with everything inside, and like, good luck. So that's not open data, that's uh, available data, but uh, open data implicated the fact to have metadata and description of what's going on, to assess the interoperability of what you have uh, put outside. So yeah, the, the problem is also that uh, after the birth of big data, after the arrival of open data, there is now GDPR. So if you're not familiar, check it out, it's wonderful. Uh, GDPR is like the new uh, data privacy rule at the European level and uh, well it was uh, advocated to uh, prevent uh, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon and all those guys to uh, vampire your private data. In the end it creates lots of uh, bureaucracy for researchers so I don't know if we won a lot in this uh, thing, in this battle, but well we have to deal with that. It's 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 a interesting uh, law, but uh, I'm not sure if it uh, is uh, preventing what is publicly wanted to prevent. Anyway, so I spoke about a lot of open stuff, and uh, I wanted to illustrate how behind this open science, openness slash uh, open access, open data, etc. So if you should. If you use, for instance, a trend, like there is an exponential uh, growth of open science keywords and became like really a buzzword. And um, so that's a, a world of phrase that has become fashionable and popular, sound technical and important, and used to impress people. And uh, I must say that when we started to talk about open science 10 years ago, it was not impressing people. People were more laughing at us, saying like, but science is already open. Why do you want to open science? So now it's like uh, Carlos Moedas, our uh, uh, commissioner at the European Commission, is like convinced that excellent science is the foundation of future prosperity and that openness is the key to excellence. So the new slogan for the European Commission is open innovation, open science, open to the world. Well, 
And so there's like a lot of stuff going on. So there is the plan S about making open access generate, uh, gener more general. There is like a, a declaration for all European countries uh, stealing uh, articles from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the fact that the right to share scientific advancement and benefit is a, a human right. And more recently, uh, the France uh, last year proposed our, <coughs> its national plan for open science uh, with the, the idea of uh, <coughs> integrating those mutations in digital practices uh, for research purpose. And even the Agence Nationale de Recherche, the, the, the French uh, national uh, funding agency, has made uh, recently uh, open science flash funding, very flash, but super fast, uh, in March. Uh, so, well, it's, it's now in the peak of the hype, I would say, and it can, we can question now what means open there, because like uh, initially people were thinking, well, openness is uh, about making uh, this knowledge accessible, somewhere like about uh, protecting from commercial drift, for instance, Creative Commons propose a legal framework to answer that. And there is no now a kind of washing around that. And so, so that's the second thing I wanted to talk about. So uh, in the same way, uh, BMW uh, started to sell uh, rent, uh, big cars with uh, that was good for ecosystems, so like the greenwashing, where you had like advertising showing you uh, this beautiful, huge hammer in the forest and all. Uh, now we have openness at all the taste you can have, and we can even question if it's even open anymore in some cases. So I, I picked up four basic illustration of that. There's this uh, post already in 2011 of people discussing the problem. But first is the predatory publishing. So there were like a list of those uh, publishers. It was like, yeah, it's open access, so it's cool. You have just to pay five hundred five thousand dollars, and your paper is gonna be open. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, that's one slippery <laughs> stuff. And actually, uh, people who tends to see the International Journal of uh, Anesthesiology and Ch Child Care as a predatory publishing uh, journal. I don't know if it exists. I just made it up, but <laughs> they are generators for that. Those kind of things. Uh, so you, if you check your spam folder, you may find a lot of that. Uh, but actually, Nature Publishing Group um, has been highly criticized about that because uh, if you're familiar with uh, Nature Publishing Group, they were like kind of bashing on the publi uh, predatory publishing initially, and then they realized that the movement was turning to open access, and they opened. Uh, scientific reports and nature communication, and now they have a world business going on with open access, with scientific report being criticized for having let it pass some papers who were not that good. And when not that good, I'm thinking of, uh, of paper talking about earth rate coherence with uh, solar waves uh, made on people who have not have really ethical commitment with. Uh, uh, with ethical committee and so on. So uh, the, the problem is not only in uh, predatory publishing uh, in India that are uh, stunning you. Uh, to me, like uh, predatory publishing is something that is more wider than that. Then there is like a second topic that is even more uh, concerning recently, uh, which is like uh, the precariousness of uh, uh, academia and digital labor. So, for instance, there's uh, Anto uh, Antonio Cassili mm -hmm. who is working on that, uh, but more at the general uh, digital labor practices. But in the case of science, we have clearly something that uh, uh, is concerning regarding uh, platform selling citizen science, and actually you have big groups. Uh, using 5,000 PhD students who wants to want $1,000 in the end to make their research and development for free. Uh, 
those things is called uh, Kaggle. And uh, actually, they even say on their own website, <coughs> free as in free lunch. I mean, that's like a, a notion of freeness uh, that is far from common good and knowledge as a common good. Uh, so it's free lunch for a big company, in a way. Uh, then there is like the, the problem of discourse versus practice. So I was talking about uh, data and making data open and versus uh, really doing open data. And finally, the MOOC, which uh, 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 especially Celia worked on this topic showing how there were like a big uh, hypocritic uh, statement about MOOC uh, wanted to help uh, developing country to access the big knowledge of MIT slash uh, whatsoever. And so first there is a big issue about the uh, form of colonialism at the knowledge level, like uh, an indirectionality of we have the, the right uh, knowledge and we are happy to share it with you. Um, but second, the fact is sociologically when you analyze who is doing MOOCs, it ended up to be right-handed white male in, uh, uh, in university and in the US. So uh, th behind these MOOCs lie also a lot of uh, this washing about openness. So we have to be uh, critical and keep our critical thinking about how uh, people took the open and copy paste the old fashioned academia or systems with just the word on the top. So I spoke about Kaggle and business modeling is a good way also to check uh, like Colombo, who is the, what is the, the guy owning the game here, where the money is go, where the money flow. And uh, for instance, the case of Nature Position Group, when you check the APC of scientific report, you understand that there is like a lot of about the money here. Uh, while uh, initially FLOSS, when it was created, was a non-profit and was really wanting to, to do something different. So there are different models. Philanthropy is one of them. For instance, the Center for Open Science benefit from the Sloan Foundation that has been working a lot about uh, opening knowledge through that. But so I come back to this gradient. You have people who are selling you free stuff. You have people who are fighting for the ideology. And in the middle, there are also a lot of people who are just thinking that doing open science just the right way to do science. And that actually, in the first place, we shouldn't have to say that. I mean, it's just like uh, we have to put this word to uh, say, well, it's working. There are new models like Wikipedia, and <coughs> we can make it. And so what Wikipedia is illustrating with this open science movement is that it's not only about uh, making the content open, but also changing the relationship of power towards this content. So for instance, uh, I was talking about accessibility, and for instance, in the case of MOOC, MIT uh, giving course to the rest of the world. Well, there are other ways of thinking knowledge and uh, making it more uh, horizontal. So there are the big challenges to go from a more top-down knowledge creation to a more uh, organic and horizontal. And that needs to change the mentalities and the tools we are using. So it's not easy, but uh, it can be done. Uh, there are a lot of people working, for instance, on how to uh, do citizen science. Uh, it's not new, for instance, in astronomy or uh, in the study of birds. Uh, amateurs and citizens have been big players in the domain. And it goes even to uh, more application in the society itself with like, for instance, Icelandic uh, trying to do their own constitution collaboratively. So there are a lot of work to do in how science can fit that. And to close the loop with the, in, uh, the beginning with the data uh, and wisdom axis, well, I guess that uh, maybe we need uh, to move away from just the open science and uh, wise science now, uh, 
trying to understand that, okay, making the content open is good, but uh, the values behind science that make uh, academia sucks sometimes, uh, that's where we have to work now. So working towards social value, collective achievement, and cooperation. And by cooperation, I just mean not exploiting people like Kaggle, but really collaborating. And uh, yeah, so that's required also to go out of the comfort zone for some institutions and people. But that's where magic happens usually. So let's hope we, we can do it. Thank you very much.